Okay, thank you. Um, so to begin, this is a leopard shark navigating a kelp forest. And the reason I have this as my opening slide is partly because my talk is largely about sharks. And I thought, well, you just need a really cool photo to start with. But really, when I first came across this, it actually reminded me of another time and another place and a significant point in my own history. And in fact, another forest. The color of the kelp here and the blue of the ocean behind there reminded me of aspen groves that I've spent a lot of time with uh, inside of actually in Colorado and in Utah. And there was a time 15, 20 years ago where I had taken a walk in the woods, which I love to do to get inspiration and clear my head and, and come up with ideas. And I had walked in an aspen grove and wound down past an old abandoned silver mine and alongside a roaring fork river and um, came up from that river and looked off in the distance and saw there was, there was a book sale on at the local library. And being an avid reader and a kind of a black belt bargain shopper, I uh, beelined straight for that book sale, descended into this basement area. And among all of these, this, imagine a small town public library, just stacks and stacks of books in random order with a couple little note cards here and there to kind of let you know this is drama, this is romance, this is fiction. And I almost immediately, in my memory, within seconds, found this book, which is The Shark, Splendid Savage of the Sea by Jacques and Philippe Cousteau. And immediately I lit up because this was the book growing up that was my favorite as a child. And I knew every photo in this book, just, I knew it cover to cover. And so I immediately picked it up for 75 cents a dollar, whatever it was, and walked out the door with it with a major score. But it wasn't until a few hours later that I discovered there was an inscription at the beginning. It was to John Denver from Jacques Cousteau and Philippe Cousteau, May 1975. John Denver had just died a few months earlier in a plane crash off the coast of California, and his estate in Aspen, Colorado had donated I guess maybe all of his books to the local library. They were selling them off. And I happened to find a book that I loved as a kid, walked out the door with it, and this was in it. Now, for 75 cents, this would be a great success story on Antiques Roadshow, right? Uh, but it didn't inspire me to actually do that. But it did inspire me to revisit my love for sharks that I had as a child. And so I, I read this book end to end again. I, I've got a bunch more books. I, I bought all kinds of uh, shark swag. Right, and you'll see here on the um, on the right on the left hand side that's a um, a tiger shark jaw that my grandparents brought me from Hawaii when I was a kid, and for a sense of scale, that's for about about an eight foot shark. Next to it is a five inch tooth I bought of this is from a megalodon, you know, precursor to the tiger shark by millions of years. This megalodon tooth with a five inch tooth, I mean, uh, the the shark that would be associated with this tooth would be about 39 feet long. And that's a medium-sized megalodon. Uh, so if you figure, for another sense of scale, the largest great white ever caught was 22 feet. This one, double that size, and they were even larger than that out there. Just totally fascinated me. But some of the things actually, in, in researching this and over the years, kind of looking into you know, sharks more and more, that fascinated me even more were things that were inspired by sharks, such as this Speedo laser racer suit. And this was inspired by shark skin, its, uh, its form and its function, the longitudinal uh, features it has there, as well as the texture of it. And as you see here, this is Michael Phelps wearing it in the 2008 Beijing Olympics. And it was so effective that at Beijing, 94% of the winners of races in the swim categories were wearing some version of that suit. 98% of the medal winners were wearing some version of that suit. And 23 of the 25 world records that were broken that year were wearing some version of that suit. So of course immediately in 2009, the IOC and the, uh, the International Swimming Federation outlawed the suit <laughs> as an unfair advantage. So uh, kudos to the shark, right? But it's also a great example of biomimicry, which is innovation inspired by nature. And biomimicry also can be defined as the conscious emulation 
of nature's forms, such as designs and the functions of that shark skin. It's processes of how things are made, like how a spider makes its silk for its web, or a, or a, um, a firefly, you know, processes chemicals to actually emit light from its abdomen. And of course, also systems, like you might find in a forest, how a lot of different things interrelate. Classic example of biomimicry. This is a burdock plant. And you can see these are the seed pods or burrs of the plant. And if you look really closely, it has these hooks, tiny little hooks. And what those do is they attach themselves to animals passing by and basically hitch a ride on whatever animal brushes up against that plant. And in effect, go wherever the animals go and propagate the species further into the woods. So a guy named George de Mistral, a Swiss engineer, is out walking his dog, comes back, he has to pluck a bunch of these things off of his shoes, off of his dog. Curious, he looks at them really closely and sees that design, and he's inspired to invent the hook and loop fastener. So in his native language French, he combined two words for velvet and hook, velour and crochet, for what we know as Velcro. Classic example of biomimicry. And if you also go into the ocean, back into the ocean, some other examples quickly here. Humpback whales have inspired more efficient fan blades and wind turbine blades. And you can see here these bumps on the leading edge or tubercles on the leading edge of the fins of the whale have actually inspired how we might make more efficient wind, uh, turbine blades there. Dolphins have been emulated for a variety, in, a, in a variety of ways, but one of the key ways is there's a company called Evologics in Germany that's created a, an undersea modem that actually is being used in tsunami early warning systems now to alert of seismic activity you know, more quickly and more effectively to alert people on the, on the ground to be able to get to safety. And it basically works by emulating how dolphins will say the exact same thing at very, very high and very, very low frequencies and everything in between. So that when the, when the frequencies are high, they're very tight waveforms, and when they're low, they're very long waveforms. And so that ensures that that gets through schools of fish, shipwrecks, whatever it is, but it's emulating that type of function that has inspired this modem. Now those are two good reasons to want to save the whales and save the dolphins, but here again, I wonder, what are some more reasons to want to save the shark, right? And so this is my first edition copy of Jaws. And this is probably not the cover most of us are familiar with, which would be more like this, right? Now this is the image that eventually went, on, went onto the cover of the book and certainly was associated with the movie posters for the movie Jaws, which really made the shark public enemy number one for quite some time. But what's curious to me is that the writer Peter Benchley never intended it that way. In fact, he was a great shark conservationist. Later in his years, he was quoted often as saying that if he were to rewrite it, he would reframe the shark as the oppressed, not the oppressor. And even in the book that I have from Cousteau, you'll see here almost comically, that it says that you know man is the number one predator of the shark. And so here I see um, a diver with certainly an, an early form of Speedo. Um, but you know, basically with, with, a, with a spear gun. So the, the shark has a sporting chance here, which in commercial fishing today, absolutely no chance. You may have seen this going around, but here's a few hundred reasons you know, to want to save the sharks. The top line here shows that approximately 12 people per year are killed by sharks. This lower area is per hour. But that's not the full image. So over 11,000 sharks are killed per hour. About 100 million sharks are killed per year, and mainly for shark fin soup. But to bring a little more sunshine back into the room, <laughs> Janine Benyus, who was widely regarded as having popularized the whole concept of biomimicry, likes to remind us that conservation begins with affection. And what she means by that is to really conserve something and want to conserve something, you, you want to have some affection for it, you want to have some respect for it, you want to have some greater appreciation and regard for it. And I'll add to that that affection begins with curiosity, meaning to build that affection I first have to have a real interest in it and to research it and look at it and want to spend some time with it, even if it's that guy or that girl over there or that song I hear on the radio or a fish in the sea. But first it begins with curiosity. 
So there was a guy named Tony Brennan, Dr. Tony Brennan, was on a walkabout in, not the woods, but here in Pearl Harbor. A lot of things he was curious, cur curious about at the time. And one was how he might create a solution that helps to mitigate, to reduce the fouling of algae and other organisms on ship's hulls. Now this is, this is big business because all of that creates drag in the water, which increases fuel costs, which increases maintenance costs in the billions of dollars. And so if he were to solve this, and at the time working with the, the Office of Naval Research, he could really come up with something really fantastic. And he was standing in Pearl Harbor and he looked out and he saw this submarine coming into port and just covered end to end with algae. And he commented to the person next to him, you know, that, that really looks like a big whale, doesn't it? And this gave kind of a spark of reasoning and, and, and revelation. And he, he researched this and discovered that sharks actually violate a rule of the ocean, which is this, things that move slowly, like whales and manatees and submarines, get fouled by organisms. And things that move fast, like dolphins, do not. Sharks, on the other hand, move slowly, but they do not get fouled. They always stay clean. And that's because of the unique nature of their skin. And what you see here, these are called dermal denticles, or skin teeth. And basically, it's the form of these denticles and their arrangement, the patterning, that inhibits the growth of algae and other organisms on a shark. So Dr. Brennan and his team biomimicked this strategy into their own version of it. These millions of tiny diamond-shaped features you see here. And for a sense of scale, each one of these vertical lines is about 26 microns across, which is basically 1 50th, 5 zero, the size of a human hair. So they found in a laboratory setting that actually this inhibits the growth of E. coli and staph and staphylococcus and things that actually cause hospital-acquired infections. Also big business, as you would assume, anything that has the word healthcare in it would be. And so they're actually using this in the hospital environment on these high-touch surface areas and these film technologies to inhibit the growth of bacteria that cause these infections. So bed rails and, and door panels, those types of things. But what's most interesting about it is that this is a solution that it can actually help us with the threat of super bugs, which you've heard about all these bacteria that actually are become resistant to things we throw, all the drugs we throw at them, like methicillin. And they keep coming back again and again, stronger and stronger. And we have to keep coming up with things to actually combat them with. This solution basically prevents anything from living there. Those bacteria die off in their generational life cycles. They have no place to live. There's nothing to become resistant to. They're also now putting this solution on endotracheotomy tubes and, as importantly, iPhone cases. Now, most of my work is actually in marketing, business development, those types of things. So I also find a fascination in the idea that all of this, and especially biomimicry, could actually drive and fuel more conservation. And the idea being that pr traditionally you may give a dollar to habitat restoration and education and awareness and, uh, and, and actually repopulating, right? But there's an opportunity and perhaps even a responsibility for companies that actually could learn from these organisms, innovate solutions that could benefit all of us based upon those functional strategies of those organisms, and then give, out, give back even greater dollar amounts to actually have an impact on the vitality and the propagation of those species moving forward. Species like the shark. Now there's a lot to be learned from the shark. Anatomically modern humans, all of us here, have been around for about 200,000 years. Sharks, 400 million. In my book, that's got to be one of our mentors, right? But outside that door, there's also billions of years of examples of R&D to inspire solutions to even our greatest challenges. And so that shark would tell you, you know, where do you begin? It all begins with just being more curious. And the saying goes that curiosity kills the cat, right? So I'll quip, though, that it may also save the shark. <laughs> and that shark, in turn, may also one day save you or me. Thank you.